Andoya Spaceport gets launch operation license, NASA decides Boeing Starliner's fate, ABL explains what happened to his RS-1, RFA is doing pretty much the same, SpaceX continues preparing for the catch of the century, Blue Origin sends six more tourists in space, and due to issues with SpaceX Falcon 9 first stage, the week of launches gets shortened. I'm Christophe Paget and this is your weekly space summary. After the Scottish spaceport, Saxoford obtained recently a launch site operation license for vertical rocket launch. This week, the Norwegian Ministry of Trade, Industry and Fisheries has granted a launch site operator license to Andoya spaceport. The new launch facility will host the inaugural flight of the ISA Aerospace Spectrum rocket. Andoya Spaceport is not new to rocket launches. It has operated since 1962 with exclusively suborbital launches with well over a thousand flights. The ambition of Andoya Spaceport to go for the orbital launch market began in 2018. In April 2021, German launch provider ISA Aerospace signed a 20-year agreement to secure exclusive access to the Spaceport's first launch pad. The license allows Andoya Space to conduct a total of 30 launches per year in a sector narrowed between 280 and 360 degrees inclination. All launches are being overseen by the country's civil aviation authority. Back in June, Boeing Starliner Calypso took off from Florida for a crewed flight test to the ISS on board an Atlas V. On board were two experienced NASA astronauts, Sunny Williams and Butch Wilmore, who were supposed to reside at the ISS for eight days, but have now been at the ISS for around 85 days. The launch went as expected, with the first and second stages ascent and capsule separation. On his way to the ISS, the Starliner capsule suffered an issue with five of his thrusters required to approach and dock safely to the ISS. SpaceX Dragon Crew 9 was due to leave for the ISS to provide relief for Crew 8, who stayed already six months in space. But in order to do so, one of the only two docks available must be freed. After many tests and reviews, NASA has decided that the Starliner will free the dock and return to Earth uncrewed no earlier than September 6th and that Sunny and Butch will be part of the Crew-9 mission and will therefore stay a total of eight months in space. SpaceX Dragon-9 will then leave to the ISS with just two crews on board, so that Sunny and Butch will join them on the way back to Earth. SpaceX will provide them with a new suit compatible with their capsule. It's clearly a blow for Boeing, however, NASA do require two launch systems to maintain presence at the ISS to indeed cater for such events. July 19th, ABL conducted a static fire of his 11th engines on his first stage RS-1 at his launch site in Alaska. The test resulted in an explosion at the pad. ABL since has conducted an investigation on the cause in order to issue a mishap report. A preliminary report is now out. In summary, all 11 engines have started correctly, but 0.5 seconds later, engine 10 was running at lower pressure than expected, and the onboard computer has generated an auto abort. It turns out that the low pressure reading was caused by a faulty sensor, and in fact, the pressure on engine 10 was nominal. However, immediately after shutdown, a fire developed external to RS-1 base, fed by fuel leaks from engine 5 and 8. The fire suppression system was able to contain the fire but was not able to extinguish it. The fire suppression system relies on tanks. After running out of water after 11 and a half minutes, the temperature reached the maximum design limits, resulting in the loss of the vehicle. According to ABL, the majority of the plumbing and electrical connections of the launch mount were damaged. 
However, the launch mount, his flame deflector and all ground support equipment were undamaged. ABL is currently trying to replicate the issue in his Mojave test site in California to get to the bottom of it. RFA first stage hot fire with his nine engines resulted in a complete destruction last week. Dr. Stefan Brischank, CEO of RFA, has released a video statement of what has happened from preliminary data. He mentioned that eight engines worked, but the ninth engine developed an anomaly, most likely generating a fire in the oxygen pump, difficult to contain, which spread to the neighboring engines. All safety mechanisms did not start in order to prevent further escalation of the damage. The fire suppression system was not adequately sized for such an anomaly. The fire turned into an oxygen fire, which compromised the first stage, which later collapsed conveniently away from the umbilical tower. The damage on the launch mount system is minimum, only located on the direct supporting system holding the first stage to the launch mount. It was the first time that RFA saw an issue on the turbo pumps of these Helix engines, despite the numerous times these engines have run in the test facility, and Stefan was confident that RFA has no reason for redesigning the Helix engine. The second, third stages and fairings are still in Saxo Vault spaceport, qualified and ready to be used for the next flight. RFA has been building another first stage for some time, which already includes hundreds of modifications, with a maiden flight expected now early next year. The investigation continues to avoid this issue from recurring in the future. At Starbase, at the launch site, SpaceX is continuing preparing for catching the booster number 12 back to site after IFT number 5. They first installed one small buffer on each Mikazila arm, to then remove them and replace them by a series of different buffers along the length of the Mekazilla arm, as you could see. The Mekazilla arms were also reinforced at their welding joints. At the production site, one of the new version 2 Starship nose cone is being tiled with quite a different coverage. We have also seen a version 2 down comma pipes for Starship number 33 with not just one, but four pipes added in the lower tank to feed the upper tank liquid methane to the engines. The same Starship is getting its lower section assembled. As for Starship number 31, SpaceX is nearly complete with the retiling of the nose cone and the new office building glass facade has progressed well. And finally, the connecting building between the Star Factory and the office has had his metal frame nearly assembled. August 29th, Blue Origin launched a new Shepard from Texas for his suborbital mission NS26 with six pain guests and one microgravity experiment. Everything went smoothly. The week started on August 28th with a Starlink mission Group 86 from Florida with a SpaceX Falcon 9. The first stage flew for his 23rd time, the oldest of his fleet, and crash landed on a drone ship. Well, to be fair, it landed properly on the drone ship, but one of the legs broke and the stage tipped overboard, resulting in his destruction. This ends an amazing streak of 267 successful Falcon booster landing in a row. The second stage and payload were not affected by it. This resulted in delaying future Falcon 9 launches until SpaceX is clear on the cause of the mishap. August 29th, Galactic Energy launched a Cirrus 1S from its sea launch platform in China for its mission How Far I'll Go. So in summary, from January 1st until August 29th, 2024, 156 rockets were launched successfully. Out of that, 100 were from an American company or institution and 36 from a Chinese company or institution. I leave you this week with an image from the Hubble Space Telescope of a bowl of gas and dust nicknamed the Bubble Nebula, but officially designated as NGC 7635. It is located in the constellation Cassiopeia, 7100 light years from Earth, 
it surrounds a star 45 times more massive than our Sun. The resulting hot gases flow towards the cooler interstellar gas in its path, forming this outer edge of the bubble. The star itself is about 4 million years old. The blue in this picture represents oxygen, green hydrogen and red nitrogen. I'm Christophe Paget for All About Space, wishing you a good week. Goodbye.